about. We're continuing our, our sermon series on vision and how to develop vision and how to project vision in our lives. And today we're going to be talking about the power of our words. So it's going to be, we're going to look at that a little bit and, and uh, really talk about uh, how the blessing of God works in and through our lives. And so I want to start by reading to you from Romans chapter 15, verses 5 and 6. And uh, this is a passage uh, that Paul wrote to the church in Rome. And the church in Rome was having a particularly difficult time. But he wrote this to them, and I, I want you to listen. In fact, as I read this, I just want you to... You can keep your eyes open if you want to read it with me, but I want you to receive this as a blessing because listen to the words of this. May the God of endurance... Remember, we told you last week that whenever we speak a blessing, or in the Bible, whenever a blessing is spoken, it normally, the normative is that it starts with may. And uh, here again, we see it in the New Testament as well as the Old Testament. So he says, may the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, together, that you may, with one voice, glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me read that again. May the God of endurance... How many of you feel like you need a little extra endurance? I saw several people drinking those cans of whatever it is. You know, you pop it and it's supposed to give you extra energy, you know? And... Uh, probably gives you lots of sugar and lots of caffeine and lots of stuff not good for you. But here, the Bible says, let the God of endurance and encouragement. How many of you need more courage in your life? You know, that's really what encouragement means, to have courage added to you. Not just to make you happy, not just to make you, but to encourage in courage, get courage into your heart. Courage for what? That you might be able to live in such harmony with one another. I mean, you know, it, it takes courage to love other people especially some of y'all. I'm just going to say, it just takes courage. It takes courage to let the walls down. It takes courage to sign up and get into a small group. It takes courage to go through the process of uh, first step, next step, not because we're trying to scare you, but because you're going to face things that, oh, i got to change, or oh, I need to, I didn't realize that about myself, or I didn't realize that about God, and if I want God's best in my life, I need to take a step and change, and none of us like change. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago. No one likes change. We're all change averse. It's like, you know, Everybody else needs to change, but not me. But here, we need to understand that God wants you to have courage because if you live, change is inevitable. Change is inevitable. In fact, when you stop changing, you start deteriorating. Does that make sense? And when you start deteriorating, you start stinking. <laughs> I'm not going to go any further, but you, you, get the, you get my gist. So we need God's courage and we need to open up. We need to let the walls down and allow God to flow in us and through us. And we do that in small groups and other ways as well. But God says, let the God of endurance and encouragement grant you such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus that together you may with one voice. Can you imagine with one voice if, if every church all across our community, all across Lee County, Harnett County, over in Moore County, and other places that we're represented, for example, if with one voice people could hear us glorify God. One of the things we do with planting churches and sharing with you about the Multiply Movement is because, you know, we're, we, we started as a few man of churches. Now we're 15, 16, 17, and growing all the time. And it's not about getting more numbers. It's about increasing our influence and being able to bring people to Christ. Can you say Amen. And so when that begins to happen, we try to give one voice so that if you are stationed at Fort Bragg and you come to Christ at Fort Bragg and you get trained at Fort Bragg and you get trained at Manor Church in Fort Bragg and then you move to Sanford and you want to come to Sanford, Man of Sanford, it's, it's not always going to be the same, but you're going to have the same core values and the same direction. And so we have one voice. We have one DNA. A little bit different in its manifestation, a little bit different in its presentation, but it's always going to have the same values going forward. This is so powerful. Jesus said it this way in Matthew chapter 18. He says, if any two of you can agree as touching or referring to anything, then, you know, when you come together, I'm going to be there in the midst of you, and I will hear your prayers, and I will move and answer those prayers for you. And we see that every week. Weekly, I get prayer requests. We share them with the congregation, and, you know, we see God answered those prayers. 
We prayed for a young man last week. In fact, he used to be a ministry part of the ministry team here 20 years ago, Troy. Uh, and Troy had to go undergo brain surgery on Tuesday. And we, we saw him in, in a restaurant, and he came up to the table, and we were sitting there eating. He came up to the table, and we spoke and got a chance to reconnect. And he told us what was going on, and, and, and the family I was with, one of the, the man just grabbed him by the hand and said, let's pray right now, and prayed for him right there in the restaurant, God and everybody watching, and just believed God with him and got a report on Tuesday afternoon. He called me actually Friday night and said he couldn't believe how well things went, and, um, you know, God just helped him and God encouraged him. When we stand together, when we pray together, when we come in one accord, it produces something that is the church without walls. It's a church that is, that is powerful and a church that not, a, not an organization as in an individual or a group like this, but the church begins to explode. I met Tuesday with pastors from all over the community, and we were praying together and uh, believing God for revival, for, for God to do a new thing in our counties. So we pray that way. When we move that way, we release something into the atmosphere, into the, the kingdom of God. In fact, let me share this with you. Uh, in their book, Words Can Change Your Brain. Now, this is a little bit of psychology, and I'm not all into that, I, you know, but I, I do understand the science. Or I, well, I don't understand it, but I never read the words anyway. But I, I, do, I do encounter this from time to time in my studies and in my training of pastors and other places. And so Dr. Andrew Newberg and Mark Walden, they wrote in their book, Words Can Change Your Brain. This is very important. It said, a single word has the power to influence the expression of genes that regulate physical and emotional stress. A single word. A single word. Their research suggests that holding a positive, optimistic word in your mind, thinking on it, meditating on it, it's not the word they use, but I'll use, it can stimulate the frontal lobe activity. This area includes specific language centers that connect directly to the motor cortex responsible for moving you into action. He goes on to say that, that if you, uh, when you keep these positive thoughts, now this is not about, we're not talking about just positive energy and you know, positive confession, those kind of things, but when you concentrate, when you meditate on these words that are affirming and positive, it begins to change the way you think about yourself and the way you think and respond to others. How many of you have ever met, um, <laughs> remember Winnie the Pooh, there was that, that, that donkey. What was the donkey's name? Eeyore. Eeyore. See, I knew you'd know who that was. How many of you have ever met an Eeyore? It's like no matter what's going on, no matter what's happening, you know, it's my birthday. You know, it's kind of like that, you know. And it's like nothing, nothing, you know, is probably going to ma- fail. And, and we can get stuck in that. And so what they're saying to us is, is that if you have that kind of personality, and some of us do, some of us are, we tend to be melancholy, but if you have that kind of personality, it's not that you're wrong, it's that you're creating a cycle that is kind of continuous in your life. And we talked about that last week, and we will again today. And we want to break that cycle, not only in us, but especially in our children and in our family. We want to be able to produce, we want to see God produce in us and through us transformation that changes the trajectory of those around us. Can you say amen? And sometimes we have people in our lives that are very negative or they're very locked into patterns that we know are patterns that destroy you know, the, Jesus said it this way. He said the thief in Matthew chapter 10, the thief, which is, he's speaking of Satan, he said the thief comes to do what? Three things. He comes to steal, help me out here, steal, he comes to kill, and he comes to destroy. And, and one of the things we've taught you here is that if you're a Christ follower, if you're a born-again believer, he can never take your salvation from you. He cannot, he cannot separate you from the love of God, Romans says. He cannot do it. But if we begin to meditate on his three primary objectives, to steal, to kill, destroy, he will limit you and cause you to walk in emotional depression, discouragement, and he'll release into your life and the life of others this downward spiral. So we want to break that in Jesus' name. Now, you can't break that just by changing the way you talk. You need the Holy Spirit to work in your life. You need to surrender to God in your life. But it starts with opening your heart and letting God change that vocabulary and change the way that you see Him and the way you respond to Him. Does that make sense? Good. It would be a good time to take up an offering if we took up offerings. But anyway, 
So look, we're talking today about the power of words. We're talking about the power of blessings. And some words are spoken audibly, some words are implied, and yet still, uh, they're, and some even are spiritually suggested, that they have power. And we want to make sure, as we're talking about achieving or coming into what God has for us, that we're in agreement with God. We want to be in agreement with God. That which is in agreement with God is spirit from his word. And that which is in agreement with the flesh or with the world and not in agreement with God is flesh, and it cannot inherit the kingdom of God. God's not going to bless your mess. He will help you come through that mess, but if you want to continue in your mess, you're just going to have that stuff going on. But if you want to break that cycle, God will help you, and His Word is powerful to bring transformation into your heart. Now, the underlying idea in all of this series is the fact that it rests on the belief that that in each of us, we've been handcrafted by God on purpose for purpose, that He designed us for an infinite plan, and our desire is to understand that. And sometimes it's difficult. i got to be honest with you. In the last few months, you know, I went through a little event myself, medical event, health event, and there were there have been a lot of moments, and I've shared this with you, where I mentally I was bombarded with ideas that were negative. And I'm talking about negative like, why did I live? Why did I survive? What was the point? And it's easy to get trapped in those places and begin to think and get on a cycle where you, instead of releasing God's best in your life, you release stress in your life. And stress produces stress. Are you with me? And it robs you of God's blessing. And I don't want that for you. I want you to understand God made you just the way you are. Now, there's some obviously some changes that take place in who we are, but he made you. He placed those gifts in you. He placed those desires in you. He placed those strengths in you. And even some of our weaknesses are there. In fact, if I believe God's sovereign, all of my weaknesses are there to help me understand, to learn, and to be transformed by God's Holy Spirit. And that's why this message has been a series in two parts. The first one we talked about uh, looking at what we see. If we can't see it, we'll never achieve it. We'll never be it. If you can't see where you're going, you will never be able to arrive at that place. And so vision is all about seeing. Now, it's not about just seeing my best idea, but it's seeing what God has for me. What is God's vision for my life? What is God's purpose for my life? And as I, as I press into him and learn that and discover that, then I'm able, I have to say yes to some things and no to some other things in order to move forward in it. But God's grace comes and enables me to do what I cannot do for myself. Now we're starting the second part of that, which is, has to do with what we say. It's not just what we see. We may, we may see ourselves in a place. We may see ourselves as a family that loves God, puts him first, that encourages one another. But if we don't change the way we speak, if we've always spoken the way our parents always spoke, and it's filled with strife and, 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 and discouragement and, and accusation, then we're not releasing blessing, we're releasing stressing. Are you with me? And so we need to change that, guys. We need to break that cycle. I need to break that cycle in my life. You need to break that cycle in your life, and that's why we're talking about this, because, listen, what you see determines your future. It's where you're going to go. What you say, however, determines how it's going to manifest and if it's going to manifest at all. You may say that you want to go somewhere or you may believe that God wants you to go somewhere, but if you don't start pushing forward in that, then you're going to be stuck. Now, when we talk about the power of words, our mind immediately goes to the idea, or at least mine does, to the idea of blessing and cursing. Let me stop for a moment. Take a breath. Sometimes I I get into this mode where I'm just delivering the information. Do you notice that? I go faster and faster and faster. I don't want to do that. Because information will do nothing but pump up your head. And it'll leave you with more knowledge than you know what to do with. But I want to speak words that bring transformation. That doesn't mean I have to speak slow. (laughs) It just means I don't want to run. I want to walk with you through this. So I had to, I have to change gears. Forgive me. So when we talk about the power of words, immediately I think of, I don't know about you, but I think of this, the terms of blessings and cursings, probably because we're in this series and we, we've been talking at least last week and this week about the power of our words and how we can release the blessing or how we can speak 
the cursing. I told you last week, and you can fill in your notes, your blanks in your notes here with this. It said, first of all, blessing is not just a prayer. You know, you sit down and someone says, who's going to ask the blessing? Ah, that's certainly a prayer. That's certainly a blessing. But the idea that we're talking about supersedes that. We're talking about uh, speaking, by the way, when you sit down and bless your food, just, if you want to be biblical, it says give thanks for your food. Give thanks for your food. Give thanks to the Lord for it first, and then you know, bless it. But anyway, because you cannot cancel fat cells, and you can't cancel, I mean, you can cancel sugar and stuff all you want, but those demons are not going to leave that Kentucky Fried Chicken, I'm just telling you. So, um, you know, uh, blessing is not just a prayer, but it's a spoken positive statement of what can be. It's like we talked about vision. Vision is having a picture of a preferred future. And so when you, when you bless someone or you speak blessing, you're speaking about what can be, not just what is, but what can be. And I want you to think about that. Gary Chapman in his book, Love as a Way of Life, uses this vivid metaphor concerning words. And I, I really want you to write this down. It's not in your notes, but I want you to write this down and, and uh, it, it, just write it in the margin, these two words or these three words. He says, we use words either as, get this now, bullets or seeds. Bullets or seeds. We use words as bullets or seeds. Now, think about the idea of blessing. Because if, you, if we use our words as seeds with a feeling of supportiveness and sincere goodwill, we can build up, we can rebuild, we can restore relationships to a place of, of, of positive love, life affirm, affirmation. Does that make sense? If we speak seeds of blessing, if we see, speak of what can be and not just about what was. So many of us get caught in the past. Anybody here besides me? And it's tough to get past your past because it hurts. We have scars from our past. We have, we have chains from our past. We have disappointments and discouragements, and we talk about that all the time. You've got to let those go, and it's not easy. That's why the cross is so important, and the blood of Jesus helps us to break that, and the Holy Spirit teaches us and empowers us to go through you see, we talked about this last week, that, that blessings are like unseen accelerators in our life. In other words, they, they give us the, the extra oomph to go forward. When someone blesses you, I mean, I don't mean just like when you sneeze, you know, and they say, God bless you, you know, that, they might as well say Gesundheit. Excuse me. In German, does Gesundheit mean God bless you? Does it really? Not really. <laughs> it's like, but, you, but, but really, I think about it when, I mean, we say it almost automatically. I, I mean, I've heard people say, God bless you, and yet at the same time, I've heard them talking and using words that doesn't really imply blessing. Does that make sense? So here, here's my point. When, when you speak a blessing into someone's life, it's like an accelerator. It helps push them. Think about it this way. Remember when you were a kid and you were on the swing set and you could just go a little bit and then your cousin came who was a little bit bigger, a little bit older and pushed behind you. Does that make sense? Remember that? And you kind of went higher than you'd ever been before. And it was like, you just felt like, man. And so when you bless someone, you're, you're actually speaking blessings. So when we say, you know, sneeze and may God bless you. What about May God bless you with health. May God bless you with strength. Oh, we don't want to do that because that feels religious or it feels strange. But just a blank God bless you, they don't even know what God you serve perhaps or they don't even know where you're coming from. But it's designed to be an accelerator. And when a person's under blessing or they're blessed, doors begin to open for them. They begin to move forward. They walk in God's favor. They begin to experience transformation in ways that they didn't expect. Sometimes opportunities just seem to fall in their lap, and the blessing of God comes over them. You know, I just have a vision for you that you'll walk in God's favor and blessing. I have a vision for you. That's why when I stand up here and speak God's blessing over you, I do it with a lot of faith because I don't look at where you are. I look at where God wants you to be. Hello? I don't look at where you are. I look at where you're going to be. I just wish I could have as much faith for me as I do for you. Does that make sense? I wish I could, I, I really need to re, retrain my mind. That's what Paul says. He says we renew our mind by the Word of God. I need to renew my mind and begin to remember that, that for me, I mean, I say it to my wife, but for me, I need to look back in that mirror and bless me. Yeah, you can bless yourself. You can invoke God's blessing on yourself. God bless me to be a better husband. God bless me because, listen, if I experience blessing, guess who else is going to experience blessing? My spouse and you, my kids. Even though they're grown, I'm setting an example for them. Are you with me? We talked about the law of blessing last week, and I want to remind you about that, that when I speak a blessing, 
I inherit a blessing. When I bless others, it comes back on me. And the principle there is found in Genesis chapter 12, verses 2 and 3. God said to Abraham, I'm going to bless you and make you a great blessing. And whoever blesses you, I will bless. And whoever curses you, I will curse. And so we are children of Abraham by faith. And so we want to be able to release that into other people's lives. When I say God bless you, it's a little selfish, isn't it? Because I'm expecting God to pour out upon you. And in return, it'll come back to me because I want to be a messenger of his grace and of his blood of his favor. Now, remember what we read from James. James is the brother of Jesus and was actually in charge of the church in Jerusalem. In fact, we don't believe that James even came to know Christ or began to believe in his brother as the Messiah until after the resurrection. And why not? If Jesus, if you could tell somebody, I'm going to die today, but in three days, I'm going to come back from the grave. And then you do. It's like, I'm going to die. I'm going to die on a cross. You're going to, and that happens. And then, but in three days, I'm going to come out of the grave, and you'll be able to see me again, and I'll be alive. And, and then three days later, they actually... So you can predict that and then actually see that come to pass. It's worth listening to what they've got to say, when you? And so they, they have some confidence. And James, the brother of Jesus, who grew up watching him do all the stuff he did and kind of stood back. He was one of them that said, hey, get Jesus to come. He's gone. He's lost his mind. <laughs> He's nuts. You know, come, come, get him to come home with us. He says this. He says, listen, you know, remember this about your your mouth and your tongue. He says the tongue is a, a real, a, 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 it's an evil, it can be evil or it can be good. He says in verse 9, chapter 3, verse 9, he says, with it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men. Are you with me? Who have been made in the likeness of God? From the same mouth comes both blessing and cursing. My brothers and my sisters, these things ought not be. And so as we're talking about the power, as we're talking about building, as we're talking about releasing these words, we've got to understand that it it takes a transformation, a renewing of our mind. We need to embrace Holy Spirit and say, Holy Spirit, I don't want to just think it. I want to live it. I want to be it. And and you know what? It doesn't matter that maybe your spouse or your person you work with or the, the car behind you, it doesn't matter that they don't exercise that. It's not about what they do. It's about what you do. It's never about what you go through. It's about how you come through. It's about how you allow God to exercise in you and through you. Remember, you're just a taxi cab for the Holy Spirit. Every situation you go in, God has a plan in that situation. I'm not meaning that you've got to go in speaking King James and praying. And ha- I'm just talking about when you're there, when you encounter something, you have the opportunity to bless or to stress to speak God's word, to speak God's life, or not. Gary Chapman goes on in his book, and he says this. He explains the negative use of words. He says, words can also be as bullets with a feeling, when we use those words with a feeling of superiority. You know, there are times that I've had people say, God bless you, and I didn't feel blessed when they said it. Come on, church. (laughs) I've had people say, I want to pray for you, and I was like, yeah, I don't think I want that. (laughs) I I don't want that prayer. Because I could see maybe ulterior motives or because I felt the condescension, you know, that some people have. And so we don't want to be that way. We don't want to use our voices that way, the inflection of our voices or the attitudes that we project to others. He says, look, if we're going to use those, our words with superiority or condemnation or like, you know, bless his heart. <laughs> you know, we Southerners like to do that. Bless your heart. Like you ain't got a clue in this world. I'm going to tell you what you need to know right now. If we, listen, I realize that if I speak to you that way, and it's easy to do because you can, you can get into a mode without. That's why I stop sometimes and say, I just need to back up here. Not because I'm going to speak wrong to you, but if, I, if I'm just, you know, machine gunning those words, they're just, you're going to finally say, hey, I can't take anymore. I don't want that for you. I really want you to get God's blessing. I want My prayer early in the morning before I come here is that God would speak through me that God would use the words that, that I've planned, but, and even he would change them if necessary, but he would penetrate your heart. And how many of you know we all have Kevlar over our hearts right now? There are areas that, you know, I'm glad you're not preaching about money, or I'm glad you're not preaching about premarital, whatever, but because we don't want to hear about that. We're not ready. But my prayer is that that word would come to you and it would be like a, um, an injection of God's love and hope. And it would be not an inoculation, but it would be the antidote to the bitterness, to the fear, to the stress, to the shame. Is that all right? 
Somebody can say amen right there. Let's, let's say it together. Let's say it together. Amen. <laughs> Sometimes you just need to say that. I know it's religious sounding, but you know, it's a good word. It means so be it. Be it unto me as you have said, O Lord. That was the meaning behind the Hebrew word, Omin. So when we speak with words of condemnation or superiority, we're not going to be able to build or restore relationships, but rather we're going to push them down. When you, when you say something like, when you ask someone to forgive you, and it's like, well, if you, think I, if you think I offended you, or if you think I hurt you, or you think when we, when we, when we kind of push things like, okay, this is on you, not me. We need to take responsibility, and that's another subject for another day. But when we take responsibility and then we choose to use the blessing of God to release God's love, I know it's hard. So I, I, hear, I, I can't read minds, but I can read faces. It's like, dude, you don't understand. You're not married to my spouse. You don't understand. You don't have my kids. You don't work in the same place I do. I know it's hard. If it were easy, everybody would be doing it. We wouldn't even need a Savior, right? If it were all easy. It's impossible. That's why Jesus died for you. And that's why his power is here to break sin and give us the great exchange, his mind for our mind, his heart for our heart. Remember, when we talk about curses, we're not just talking about profanity. We're talking about a spoken negative statement of what is without regard of what can be. Sometimes we say things like, you're just like so-and-so, or you never change. It's always been this way with you, and you'll never change. I said that recently about one of my kids. They did something, and it was just like they had done t- for 20 years. And, and I, said, I said it out loud. I said, I can't believe that. You're all, my, it wasn't Leah, just so you know, because she's here. She, she'd be like, you're looking at me. It wasn't Leah this time. But anyway, I, I caught myself. I caught myself. I said, I can't believe it. That one always does that. The minute I said it, the moment it came out of my mouth, I was filled with shame. I'm just being honest because I know that's not true. But what did I just speak in existence over that child? Now, that child's a grown individual. Got kids of his own, her own. (laughs) Not going to trick me up. But I spoke. I spoke that they, had, they didn't change, they couldn't change, that they had a pattern, and whether that's true or not, I'm the one that coaches to change. I'm the adult who says to my son or to my daughters, hey, I love you, and you've got a wonderful family, but this, there's a change that I, I would like to suggest or encourage you with. It's not that I'm, I'm perfect, but I'm the most perfect dad they've got. And so even with my failures, are you with me? They know my life, and so I have earned a place to speak into their life. But I want to speak a blessing and not a stressing. So whenever we speak, if it's negative, if it's condemnation or it's superior, it can, it can actually bring a curse. And a curse operates as a limiter in their lives. It puts a cap on them. A person under a curse feels like they're under a glass ceiling. They never can get to the next level, and they can't move forward. The law of cursing says that, you know, to speak a curse, you inherit a curse back. When I curse someone else, just to keep that in mind, when I speak that curse, the thing I release is going to come back, especially if they don't deserve that curse. The Bible says it in Proverbs that a curse spo- unjustly spoken, a judgment unspokenly un- unjustly spoken, will not land where you send it, but it'll flitter around like a sparrow and come back to where it was sent from. Now, keep that in mind the next time you're thinking that way. Talking about the power of words, this reminds me of a story I heard, and and I'll just share it with you real quick because I think you really need this. A woman was sitting at uh, her deceased husband's funeral. This actually happened to me, and a man leans up to her and asks, "Uh, do you mind if I say a word? No, go right ahead, the woman replies. So the man stands up and he clears his throat. Everyone looks at him, has his attention. He says, plethora. And he sits back down. The woman responds, thanks. That really means a lot. Okay, I'll let that sink in. I didn't, I didn't go over quite the way I expected it to. But anyway, the, word, the word plethora means a lot. Anyway, okay. Just trying to give your brain a break here. So look at, look at number one, and I'm, 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 I'm going to get us through this in just another minute or two. Look at number one. The power of blessing originates with God, the Creator. The power of blessing originates 
with God the Creator. So in other words, God spoke everything into existence, and God speaks blessing. And, and, and we see that first in Genesis chapter 1, verses 28 to 31. And God blessed them, talking about Adam and Eve. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish, over the birds, over every living thing that moves. And God said, Behold, I've given you every plant, every tree. It, he goes all through his provision. His blessing over them was provision, protection, and authority. And at the very end, he said, and God looked at it all and said, this is very, very good. So the idea of God's blessing begins with him. I think that's also what makes their betrayal uh, so treacherous, so, so hard to understand because God gave them everything and the enemy questioned the goodness of God. And that's what he does for you and I. God starts moving in your life. God starts blessing us. And the enemy comes, steal, kill, destroy, and starts questioning God's motives. Listen, even when you're going through the valley of the shadow of death, and for some of us, it means one thing. For others, it means something else. And you get right in there, and it's like the enemy immediately begins questioning God's goodness. Why? Because if he can get you to turn on God and begin speaking still kill and destroy, he can begin releasing more death, more destruction in your life and in the lives of those around you. Are you following me? But if you begin to realize that even in the valley of the shadow of death, I don't have to fear evil, for thou art with me. You just have to do that one, King James. Thou art with me. And understand, no matter what I'm facing, I am not facing it alone. And I begin to speak that to myself, and I speak that to my children, and I speak that to my wife, and I speak that to you, that what you're facing is not unique, and it's not going to change. You know, the world is not coming apart. It may feel like it's unhinging right now, but God is big enough to walk with you through this, and if you will let him, he will bring transformation in your heart and in the heart of those that you're with. And I know that some of those situations, as I look out there, some of those situations, you cannot see a positive outcome today. I get it. And I can't guarantee you what the outcome's going to be. I can just guarantee you that Father already knows. And if you embrace Him throughout this process, it won't be what you go through, but how you came out on the other side that you will remember and people will look at and say, now that's God. You see, we have to sometimes embrace the moment but embrace it with an understanding, with faith, and with understanding that God is here with us. Genesis chapter 12, verses 2 and 3, God makes a covenant with Abraham, and I love what he says. He says, I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you. Now, remember, Abraham only had two kids. He said, but I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and and you will be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all the people of the earth will be blessed through you. And if you know anything about your Bible, or you've been around here a little bit, you understand that Jesus was in that lineage, and you and I, according to Galatians, are part of Abraham's seed. God said to Abraham, he says, look up, look down, see the sand? If you could count the grains of sand, that would be the number of your children. Then he says, look up at the stars. If you could count all those stars, that would be the number of your children. That's the number of your descendants. Man, that's blowing my mind. One of my old theology theology professors told me one time, he said, you know, when I heard him say, look at the sand, he said, you know, I just kind of had a thought. That's his natural seed, all the children of of Israel, all the children even of Ishmael, which later became the Arabs. And um, he said, you know, that's the physical number of his seed. But then when he looks up to the heavens and he points, at the stars, he said, I believe God was prophetically speaking about you and I. We weren't naturally born Jewish or naturally born part of, uh, of, of Ishmael's seed, but we were born by the Spirit because we received Jesus Christ by faith. And as such, we become the children of Abraham and under the blessing of Abraham. Are you with me? And that's why when we speak God's blessing, when we bless others, God also blesses us, and that releases that power within each of us. If you look through the Scriptures, and I've got them there for you, you don't have to, but when in Genesis chapter 5, 25, Abraham blesses Isaac. Then Isaac blesses Jacob, his son, who later became Israel. Jacob blesses Pharaoh. This is the guy that in 300 years, 400 years, will end up oppressing them. But God speaks a blessing through him to this individual and to his seed. And Jacob speaks, as Israel speaks a blessing on his sons and his grandsons. 
And some of those were not positive blessings because he called out negative traits in him. He said, because you're angry, because you're bitter, because you did these things, this is going to follow you all the days of your life. We call those generational curses. But thanks be unto God, the blood of Jesus can break those curses and set us free. Give me just a couple more minutes and I'll finish this up. A blessing, listen, is a seed. It's a seed. It is a statement of faith. It is a statement of faith. It sees what can be and doesn't just dwell on what is right now. doesn't mean that I can change you. doesn't mean that I can you know, uh, speak that which is not as though it were. That's a passage in Scripture, and a lot of people like to use that and, and declare it and pray it and those kind of things. It's, it's not about my words creating. This is about God's word creating. This is about God's will being manifest in their lives, not my will being manifest in their life. But when I bless others, when I bless the family, even, even myself, even my children, even those that are around me come under the acceleration of blessing. How many of you want that acceleration? How many, I mean, seriously, how many of you want to experience a, a push? All right, I'm glad you said that. I want you to look to your left and to your right. Come on, look to your left. That's this way and this way. <laughs> okay, if there's nobody on your left, then look to your right. All right, now, I want you to put, take that person by the hand. Now, I know that, you know, we've got viruses and stuff, but in Jesus' name, nothing's going to spread. I want you to take that person by the hand. And listen, I want you, no matter how well you know them or don't know them, you come right on up here. Come on. Come on. Oh, oh, no, okay, all right. Turn around, turn around right there. Come on. You guys are sitting by yourself. First of all, don't sit by yourself anymore because you get me, make it hard for me. Come on, grab somebody's hand. Yeah, make, make it easy on Pastor Tom. He can't take all this stress, you know. Anyway, I want you, to, I want you to speak a blessing over them right now. And this is a time when health issues are going on. There's viruses going on. There's things like that. Come on, you got nobody's hand. Oh, you, okay, okay, okay. What about over here? Come on. Come on. Every, oh, come on, man. Come on. Hey, all right. Now, I want you to take a moment, and in the name of Jesus, I want you to speak a blessing over them. I want you to speak a blessing of health. May the Lord bless you with health. May, well, go ahead. Just speak that to them. May the Lord bless you with health. May the Lord bless you with peace. Come on, let's just get into it, right? <laughs> we'll get hip deep in a minute. God bless you. May the Lord bless you with health this week. May the Lord bless you with peace this week in Jesus' name. And bless the other person if you did. If you gave a blessing, then you, you make sure. All right, good. Listen, when you begin to speak that, you're speaking a statement of what can be and what God wants to do in their life. Jesus, I love this, Jesus blessed the disciples in, in Matthew chapter 5. Jesus gives us, it's really the only transcript, sermon transcript we have of Jesus. And so I think if I really wanted to just preach the message of Jesus, I'm really putting myself in the, I just should preach the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 5, it's also in Luke. And, and, and anyway, he says, uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 1 through 3 says, Seeing the crowds, Jesus went up on a mountain. I was just recently at this mountain, and it really is a mountain, and it's kind of a natural amphitheater. And Jesus climbs up on the mountain on the top of the hill, and looking down, he, uh, he sat down, and when he sat down, his disciples came up to him and gathered around him. Now, remember, disciples are, are at least 12 and could be as many as 70, but it, they come and they sit around him. And then what happens? Now we get a little crowd, and guess what else happens? Other people came and sat around him because they had either heard the message, that, but more importantly, there's something going on up there. Look, there's a crowd. Wherever there's a crowd, they're just going to grab, grab them more people. And Jesus began to teach them. He began to teach them, and he starts out, and I'm not going to go through the whole message. I know you're happy. It says, he opened his mouth and taught them. Verse 3 said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed is the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And he goes on, he says, gives them nine different kingdom principles, characteristics. Blessed are those. And he, he basically, he raises the bar so high. Remember the time that the disciples said to Jesus, said, Jesus, this is too hard. I mean, he was talking about marriage. He said, nobody should ever get married, one of the disciples said, because what you're talking about, we can't live under that. We can't do that. We can't, you, you're saying if I look at another woman and lust after her, that's adultery. If I get angry in my heart, that's bitterness and that's murder. It's like, I can't go there. I'm going to break all ten all the time. And yeah, that's exactly what Jesus wanted them to see. And he wants you and I to see. And so here he raises the bar. He says, look, blessed are the poor in spirit. Not poor in pocketbook, poor in spirit. Humble. Has an attitude that recognizes the need to 
need for God and the need for other people. And he, he raises the bar so high that it likely discouraged. I mean, you, you've heard those messages and you're like, wow, that's really deep. And then you go home and it's like, I didn't understand a thing they said. Or it's like, I just that can't, I can't do that. I'm not ready for that. I, I can't go there. And so a lot of what Jesus said, they would come to him later and they'd say, look, could you explain that a little better to me? Because I didn't quite get what you said about, you know, blessing my enemy, you know, and forgiving my brother. I mean, what do you mean about how many times do I have to forgive? Seven times 70? That's like, I can't even, Matthew, who was a tax collector, what is that number, man? It's a, are, you, are you following me? In fact, if you think about the group that he had, <laughs> you, you look at Peter. Peter was hot-headed. He was a coward that denied Christ during Jesus' most difficult time. There was Judas who was sitting there who sold Jesus out for a few coins. There was James and John who there was this one point where some guys were kind of contending against Jesus and they weren't like, they weren't like supporting Jesus. And he just, they just said to Jesus, Jesus, should we just call down thunderbolts on them right now? Should we just call down fire and consume them? Why don't I have some disciples like that? You know what I mean? Like, anyway, I, I, we'll burn them up right here, and Jesus rebukes them. And they became known as the sons of thunder, you know, and that wasn't because they just talked loud. It's like because they just lose it. They, they just Their mind would be gone, man. They would just lose it, and uh, they would lose their tempers. Thomas, whose lack of faith is legendary. Philip and Andrew, who both choke when feeding the 5,000. What, what must we do? How can we do this? It'll never work. It'll never work. My point is that they were blessed even at the time they were unworthy or had not achieved. In fact, this is what Jesus said in verses 13 and 14. He looked at these, these guys who were not the epitome of blessed men, who were still in the process of learning what it meant to follow Christ, whose sins had not yet been forgiven and atoned for on the cross. They were still walking in the old covenant, and he looked at them, and he says, listen, there's going to come a time, and this is the way you're going to see things. This is the way you're going to walk. This is the kingdom reality. And they were like shaking their heads. I would be. But then he says to them, they were feeling, un I mean, I'm just assuming I wasn't there, right? But I'd be feeling unworthy. I'd be feeling defeated. And Jesus looks at him and says, but listen, you are the salt of the earth. Even with your problems, even with your brokenness, even with your poor relationship, even with the issues, even though you've been divorced, even though you've, 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 you've had this thing going on in your life, even though you've got cancer, even though you're still the salt of the earth. In fact, he goes on to say, you're like a city who is set on a hill. And you're like, but wait a minute. Look at all these warts. Look at all these problems I've got. Look at all these, these things that are wrong with me. And he said, you're still like a city set on a hill. Why? Because the light on the inside begins to manifest when you follow me. Are you with me? And so when you bless others, this idea, they don't have to be worthy of blessing. But when we speak God's blessing, when we look at them and we speak God's blessing, we're speaking about that which is to come. We're speaking about that which can be. We're speaking about that which is not yet manifest, but soon will be. A blessing is a statement of faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, evidence of things not seen. We're going to talk next week about how to bless your children if you have children or how to bless others. We're going to talk specifically about it, but can you imagine beginning to speak over their marriage now? I first started praying over my daughter's husbands the day I brought them home. I started praying over their husbands that God would give my daughters husbands that would first love him even more than they would love her. That he would give my daughters a husband. And then, of course, my son came and I had to change and pray over him too. That, that God, you would bring spouses into their lives that would love them, that would honor you, that would put you first, and in so doing would raise them in their spiritual level. Now, listen, I'm not boasting. I'm just saying, by the grace of God, to this point, I see God has answered that prayer, though it was 30-some years in the making. And I prayed over them, and I continued. Now, my wife and I, we pray over them every night. We pray over you every night because we know just what the enemy knows and what he wants to do in your life. But we know greater is he that is in you than he that is in this earth. And even though th sometimes things don't turn out the way we think they should or the way we planned, 
We know. We know. Because we've lived long enough in this life. We've watched it. We've read it. We've experienced it. That in spite of what I've been through, I'm still, there's still light in me. His light. Not my own. I'd like you to bow your heads with me, please. Now, the first, I want to offer two prayers this morning. The first one would be just in response to this word. If God spoke to you and there's some adjustment that you can see that you need to make, maybe it's the way you've been speaking, maybe you've been using your words wrongly. You just want to be more of a blessing, but not just the word. You want to actually be that embodiment of blessing. Just kind of lift your hand right now and I want to pray this prayer and you can pray this with me. It simply says, Father, in Jesus' name, if this is you, just agree with me in prayer right now. Pray it in your heart. In Jesus' name, Lord, I ask you to make me aware of your blessing. And Lord, I pray that you would forgive me for the times I've spoken words that were silly and words that were filled with stress or words that were filled with, with death or destruction. God, I want to be one who builds up, not tears down. I want to be one who releases the kingdom of God, not impedes the kingdom of God in the lives of others, in Jesus' name. And I just receive your forgiveness, and I just declare that I'm changed by the power of the Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name.